who am I? I am a uh, mom to John Michael. Um, I also spend, have been spending some time in community. Um, I'm the Woodstock WordPress meetup organizer and former um, organizer of WordCamp Atlanta. Um, I run Sugar Five Design. We're a little web shop just north of Atlanta. We specialize in small business and medical marketing. Um, I, as Nathan said, we also, um, I also am the lead instructor at Medical Marketing Unlocked, where we help uh, marketing agencies learn to navigate HIPAA regulations. And um, I also partner with a wealth management firm, so our, our company can help you um, grow your profits and then make your profits grow. So, but I am also a neurodivergent supervillain. So I don't know if you noticed, but I've got a gray streak, which is the hallmark of every really good supervillain. Um, and everybody's hero is a villain to someone else. Being a hero is just not that fun feeling for me, but being a villain, I can get down with that. So who are you? So um, I'm here to talk today about running your business when you're neuro spicy. And um, my particular neurospiciness um, might not be yours, but here's some of the common ones that show up in the WordPress space. I would say a good majority of us who do this work um, are neurospicy in some way. Um, here's some of the common ones. Uh, mine is ADHD. So, um, and I probably have some of the other ones, but this is the one I have a diagnosis for. And um, I am, was formerly fueled by coffee, hence this theme. And I'd like to talk about potential and how we can um, reach our potential in our businesses, but also what it means when you reach your potential. So I'm, I don't have like, hey, you need this tool, you need this thing. Um, what I really want to talk about is learning to manage your energy and where your focus goes, because uh, if you have ADHD like me, focus is the main thing that you, energy and focus is what you struggle with. And every one of us has probably heard at some point in our life, um, you know, you have so much potential if you could only reach your potential. And um, everybody wants to reach their potential into they do. And what happens when you've maxed out your potential we usually call that burnout, right? When you've hit that wall and you are doing everything you can and you can't do anything more. Um, and that uh, is a problem. And one of the, what leads to burnout is um, we can't sustain our energy and focus for other people's priorities. But we also have trouble sustaining our energy and focus for our own priorities, unless Dopamine. We need lots and lots and lots of dopamine because with dopamine, we can do anything. So talking about neurodivergent motivation, specifically ADHD, um, we get motivated and get our dopamine from different places than neurotypical people do. So for us to be efficient and productive, we need the task and the dopamine. And together we can be efficient and productive. Without those things, we just have a task that's just hanging. And we, we, we don't know why we can't do it, but we just can't do it. Um, so here's the different types of neurodivergent motivation for ADHD specifically. Novelty, urgency, and interest. So novelty, I mean, we all know what new shiny means, right? Like that's the thing that we wanna go to. Urgent, like, um, we can probably do two weeks worth of work in the 45 minutes before something's done, due, right? Um, and interest, um, is it, is it my, in my special interest area? Is it challenging? Um, is it something that is going to stimulate my brain and give me dopamine? Because with dopamine, I can do anything. But this is different from neurotypical motivation. Neurotypical motivation consequences, importance, and rewards. Um, how many of you have had someone say, I don't understand why you can't do this because if you don't, these are the consequences that are gonna happen. 
or this is so important, why can't you like muster the focus when it's this important? Or you know if you do what you'll get out of it. Well, our brains just don't work that way because um, neurotypical motivation just doesn't work for us. Neurotypical workflows don't work for us. And neurotypical workloads don't work for us. <clears throat> And because we're not neurotypical. And if you try, keep trying to push yourself into a neurotypical box to, folk, to um, exist and function like they do, then that ultimately leads to burnout. And that doesn't mean that we can't handle the same types of problems and we can't handle the same types of projects. It just means we have to manage our energy. And that's something I really want to talk about and make you think about today. So that's me. And why is, why is that me? Um, because I feel like things are always going a little sideways for me. Um, but that's okay, because I'm having fun. Um, so we are really great. And some of the great, we always talk, think about the downsides of having ADHD. But some of the upsides are, um, you know, sometimes you can be super energetic. You know, also sometimes you can be drained. But the upside is energetic, super creative. And when the dopamine is there, we can be hyper-focused and spontaneous, passionate. And my God, if I'm not the most competitive person I have ever met, you know, and competitiveness is, does give you the competitive edge. But <clears throat> what a lot of us struggle with is being seen as being um, reliable, right? So in, if you're not managing your energy well, your inner integrity may not be translating to outward integrity. If you're missing deadlines, if you are not able to follow through because you don't have a good plan to manage your neurospiciness, then our outer integrity um, suffers. And so that's what um, we want to address. So where we want to make sure is that we're focusing on our strengths and where our energy goes and understanding that there are going to be some places where our energy fails and we, we need to plan for that and we need to adjust for that. So when we, when we don't plan for that, we um, get burned out. And I hit a really big burnout during the pandemic. Um, when I say I reached my potential, every bit that I could do, I did. And then I couldn't do any more. And that felt like failure. So everybody says, well, you know, if you could just reach your potential. Well, I did, and it was a failure. And um, I had to learn how to restructure my life so I could continue on. At the time, I was running a business, homeschooling a child, um, and also um, trying to support my community. And I couldn't even support myself because I was burned out. <clears throat> so talking about energy, introverts versus extroverts. I know you probably all know this, but introvert does not mean shy. It can mean shy, um, but I am an introvert and I'm probably one of the most outgoing people you've ever met. Um, I could talk to a rock and we'll be friends and um, be messaging on Twitter before the day is over. <clears throat> but Introversion, me, introversion versus extroversion is really more a managing of energy. We're going to be talking about this the whole time. Um, introverts get drained in um, complex social environments, and extroverts get charged up. So um, introverts want really more meaningful, deep one-on-one -on -one conversations, and extroverts really, they just get charged up with just like, the chaotic nature of um, lots and lots of attention and focus. Um, and I used to think I was an extrovert and then I was just really sleepy afterwards. <laughs> no, no, I'm, a, I'm an introvert. So, um, what activities do you do in your business where it gives you life and you just feel so vibrant, right? and so alive versus the activities that you do in your business that make you feel like you're going to die, you know? Um, I think tracking this and, like, understanding if I'm going to be doing today, if I'm going to be 
um, speaking to a lot of people and I'm going to be doing things that drain me. I, I don't need to have too many of those things in my schedule for a day because I know myself and I know I'm going to run out of what I'm of my energy. Now, this is a really, really touchy subject. Internalized ableism. Um, growing up with ADHD, there's probably a good chance that you heard things and messages about yourself and your value that you internalized over time. Are you lazy? Do you not care? Why can't you do something? Are you faulty? Are you broken? No, you're not, but you may be carrying these internalized messages and they force you, like compel you, make it compulsive for you to keep trying to do things that your brain is not set up to do. Um, that's what really led to my burnout. I was sitting at my desk up to 12 to 16 hours a day some days trying to get four tasks done that my brain could not do. And I kept trying to force it and force it. I know I can do this. I know I could do this, but I couldn't do it because I wasn't managing my energy. I was trying to push myself into a neurotypical box. I didn't get diagnosed until I was 49 years old. And when I tell you it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I was like, oh, this explains so much. I've been trying to live as a different person than I really am. And I'm not broken. And I know ADHD is technically a disorder. Um, I'm not a medical professional, but having spent time in the ADHD community, my personal opinion is ADHD is just a natural variation of the human experience. You know, we were built for a different type of society than we have right now, and that's okay. Because we, um, I feel like what we do have is superpowers. But we might still need to be peeling back that onion and looking at the messages that we are telling ourselves. Non um, judgmental self observation is one of the most powerful tools that I have in my toolbox of my personal growth and learning how to navigate this. Um, I can say, oh, I didn't realize that I thought that about myself, you know, just by observing the thoughts that I'm saying, because that can drain your energy as well. Has anybody heard of spoon theory? So spoon theory is a term coined by Christine Misarendino, and um, she's a uh, kind of a very popular blogger, and she was talking to a friend uh, one day about what it was like to live with chronic illness. And while this isn't really an illness, um, it is a, a disability. And um, the, what she, the way she described it is she grabbed a bunch of spoons out of her pantry and she laid them out on the table. And she said, imagine each one of these spoons is a unit of energy that you have for the day. And this is all the energy you have for the day. And anything that you're doing that is not naturally energetic for you cost you a spoon. So maybe that might be for some people just getting up and taking a shower and getting dressed, you remove a spoon. Do you have to go and be in a noisy environment if you're sensory sensitive and um, maybe go shopping and the music is grating on you and the people keep bumping into you, remove another spoon, right? And you keep, you know, she kept doing this, and when all the spoons are gone for the day, whatever, however many spoons you have, and everybody has a different level of spoons. How, but when all your spoons are gone, you crash, and you're burned out for the day, and you have to rest. But you can borrow spoons from the next day and just keep pushing and pushing and pushing, but that is what causes illness. So also when you're running your business with ADHD, and if you find yourself being sick and missing Product, productivity time because you're ill a lot, are you borrowing spoons from the next day? And think about like as you're going through the day, just being aware of how your energy levels drop or rise with different things you do can help you manage um, your productivity. And with the things that when I say the activities that give you death, the ones that just make you want to die, like if you're tracking this stuff as you go along and you're, you're um, thinking about, you know, what really costs me spoons? Where am I really getting drained? 
this is something that you can start thinking about delegating to somebody else. If you have a team, maybe this is thing, these are things that your team can do. Um, and I, last week I heard this lady on TikTok and TikTok is like the best thing ever, but also an ADHD ears kryptonite. Um, I was almost late today because I was watching TikTok um, before I got in the shower. Um, so she said, this lady said that um, what she found really helpful was making, you know, we all have to-do lists, right? Um, and, and lists and planners are the bane of an ADHD ears life. If, could you just get a planner? Everyone says to us, why don't you just make a list? Come on. Like, why didn't I think of that? But anyway, so she says instead of having a whole list of all the things that she thinks she needs to get done today, she'll choose four. What are the, what's the priority? And she'll put that on her to-do list. And everything else that she thinks that she needs to get done, she puts on the list to delegate to the universe. And um, what ends up happening is, like, when you have ADHD, your brain just keeps running and running and running with all the things you have to do. But when you delegate it, you can kind of shut that channel down and that energy is no longer being depleted, thinking about the things you need to do because it's been delegated. And she said what ended up happening was almost miraculously things on the list that had been delegated to the universe, things started just getting done. And that's, you know, probably scientifically speaking, that's probably because your subconscious is working on it because you know it's a problem. But, you know, if you're woo-woo, you can ascribe other reasons. So here's, uh, here's your takeaways. Um, these are things that help me um, throughout the day, just little tips and tricks. Um, keep your shoes on. So if I keep my shoes on during the day, if I'm working at home, it keeps signals my brain that I am still active for the day and um, that I'm doing stuff. But I take my shoes off, I might as well take my bra off too. We're done. Like, <laughs> we're done. Uh, dopamine stack. So do you have something that you really don't like doing? You can pair it with something that gives you dopamine. For me, I would rather take an old school beating with a belt than do my bookkeeping. Like I just, I hate that more than anything. But right now I don't have a team member to delegate my bookkeeping to. And so what I do is I pair it with an album that I really, really love. And so for that, um, Icarus Falls by Zane is my productivity album. It's an hour and 35 minutes long. It's a double album. And if I need 90 minutes of productivity on doing something that I just, I don't really care for, I will pair it with listening to this album. And I've done that so many times now that when I turn on that album, my brain switches on because I have trained it to associate productivity with that music. Also, Pomodoro techniques, because we are competitive, deadlines are important to us. Um, and so Pomodoro is kind of like where you can set a timer for 20, 30, 60, 90 minutes, whatever your um, stretch is, and, um, and do that and then take a structured break. And you have to stop when you're done. And so it forces you to take breaks. Because also, even if we're, we're not being productive, sometimes we find it hard to stop stop in our inefficiency because we're like, but I need to get this done. No, you need to take a break and come back. Um, GDC JRS. So this is a system that I um, came up with to help my son clean his room. And my son also is a little neurospicy, so we have a lot of fun and a lot of mess a lot of the time. So we have to have systems in order to manage um, our home, and maybe there's a version of this that you could use in your business. And so what it stands for is garbage, dishes, clothes, junk, reset, and sweep. Because he would look at his room and say, this is overwhelming, I don't know how to do any of this. And I say, well, but do you know how to go grab all the garbage out of your room? You know how to go get the dishes, how to pick up the dirty clothes, how to put the junk where it goes how to reset the room, like if the pillows go over here and this is kind of moved out of place. And you know how to sweep. And so each one of these things takes him about three minutes. And I'll tell him if he's got, if he's getting bored or I just need him to go do something, I'm like, go pick a letter. 
And he knows what that means. And he'll go pick a letter and he'll do it and he'll just go on with his day. But I found this very helpful for myself because there's a lot of times I've got a lot of things to do. And in my mind, I'm like, that's going to take forever. And in reality, how many of you have put something off for weeks? And then when you went to go do it, it took you 15 minutes. Yeah, like for real. Um, so having a list, this is kind of like I have a list of things that take me between five and 15 minutes that I have to do on a recurring basis. And when I'm like, okay, I know I need to get stuff done, but I'm like spinning my wheels. I'm like, just go pick something off the list, right? Um, and also we think we're gonna remember things, but we don't. I mean, I can remember an exact conversation from the last time me and my romantic partner got into an argument and I remember everything he said and blah, blah, blah. But if you ask me what is next on my to-do list or what I have to get at the grocery store, nothing, right? So um, I have just, just decided that I'm outsourcing that to Alexa. So every time that um, I'm like, oh, I'm out of this, Alexa put this on the shopping list. And I've got an IFTTT um, integration with from Alexa to Trello for my to-do list. Um, like I have project management, but then sometimes I've just got stuff in my head. I'm like, oh, I gotta get this done. Alexa put this on my to-do list, right? And so that has, just that one thing has changed my life. Um, and then PM guy versus AM guy. Does anybody here have an AM guy that's a go-getter and a PM guy that just screws everything up? Yeah. <laughs> Right. Um, my PM, my PM gal um, is lazy. And she when she is done, the shoes are off, the bra has slung out the arm. Um, we are done for the day. And um, and she's kind of a jerk. Uh, but I had focused for the longest time on my morning routine because we hear, oh, you've got to have a great morning routine, morning routine. But what I'm finding and being in the ADHD community and, you know, really observing myself non judgmentally is that the bedtime routine is really the most important. Because in the morning, you're already in the day, right? You're, and I find it much easier if I'm emotionally detached that I'm preparing for a time that's not now. I can, like, the, the stress is off and I can do things and enjoy them um, as opposed to in the morning. Like, I have to have my clothes set out the next day, like, make sure that I know what I'm eating for breakfast because I actually have to journal out what I'm eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner or I will like get into a hyper focus and then realize I'm starving and now I don't know how to feed myself because I'm like stressed out. Um, but then if I can just look at what I'm eating, I'm okay, I know what I'm doing. I bet you're wondering about eyebrows, right? <laughs> so eyebrows, um, so if you raise your eyebrows, it releases and you hold them up for a little bit, it releases a microdose of dopamine and serotonin. And um, so if you're finding yourself stressed out, you can just raise your eyebrows. But if you ever see me walking around like this, get out of the way. I'm not having a great day. <laughs> All right. And um, I'd like to just, I'm not a doctor, but I would like to emphasize that medication is not the enemy. For a lot of people, Medication is literally life-saving. I was diagnosed earlier, la middle of last year, and um, I was put on Adderall. And within two hours, my brain turned on for the first time in my life fully. And there was a, um, a task that I had been putting off for four months because it seemed so overwhelming that I could not move forward. And it was costing me thousands of dollars a month. Within two hours of my first dose, it was done. And this is not everyone's experience. But for me, I had been living my entire life on 20% of my brain power. And so getting medicated has been, um, one, I was no longer anxious and depressed, and um, I was able to fully function as a human. Um, I'm not saying that anybody who's not medicated isn't human. Obviously, we are, but um, it is there is an issue with how much dopamine our brains make versus how much our environment requires, right? And there's nothing wrong with not medicating but there's also not anything wrong with medicating. And we hear a lot of messaging around 
ADHD is, uh, or Adderall and Ritalin and Vyvanse and all of these things, that they are just crutches. Well, yeah, when you've got a broken leg, you do need a crutch, right? So um, when I say, I, I'm basically an evangelist for ADHD medication because it has changed my life. I was, I was so depressed and anxious and I had had to come off my um, depression medication because my, uh, I was having problems with my blood pressure. And when I went and had my first medication appointment, the doctor, asked, I said, Do well, well, now that my blood pressure is back under control, should I start back my, um, my depression medication? She goes, no, let's wait. Most people, when they get on medication, their depression and anxiety severely drops, you know, you know, it almost goes away in most cases because you've been fighting a brain that doesn't match your environment for so long um, that you just become depressed. Um, I also, my blood pressure um, didn't, I started not have lot, a lot less problems with my blood pressure and I dropped 15 pounds because I was no longer compulsively trying to soothe a brain that didn't match my environment. So... I would like to just encourage you to embrace your superpowers and give yourself grace for the ways that your brain doesn't match your environment because that's not your fault. And, but if you continue to live like it does match your environment, you're, it's going to hurt you and you're going to be less productive and you're not going to enjoy yourself as much. So does anybody have any questions? I went through that pretty fast. <laughs> Anybody? No? Yeah? Hello? No. Nope. Yep, there we go. There we are. <laughs> uh, right. Thank you, April. That was fantastic. I enjoyed thank every every single minute of your thank presentation. Thank you. Thank um, you. Any questions? No. Nope. How about this? Does anybody have a thing that... Um, people have told you uh, or bad advice that people have for ADHDers? I'm going to give you an example. I, um, I found these last night on Twitter. See if it um, resonates with anybody. One, just make a list. Make a list. Um, or buy a planner. Anybody? Anybody have planners? Anybody have 47 planners? Just focus. Wow, why didn't I think of that? Um, don't overthink it. Like I have a choice, all I do is overthink. Uh, anybody else have anything that they, that they hear a lot that's unhelpful advice? Or maybe you have some helpful advice. Yes. Uh, well, I don't, I don't have anything to add to that list because I've heard all of them, but First of all, you said you were diagnosed at 49. I thought you were 35, so, I, you know. Uh, but uh, I was diagnosed when I was about 30, and uh, I, I also have high blood pressure. Mm. And uh, lately, I've, I've had to come off of Adderall because of that. What, uh, do you know anything? And I, I, I understand the disclaimer that you're not a doctor. Right. I, I kind of figured you probably weren't. I probably not. Uh, yeah, but uh, do, you, do you know of anything that maybe doesn't have that same, because, I mean, it's basically it's a stimulant. The only thing I found that wasn't is Stratera, which the doctor put me on a dose that caused me to be sleepy all the time. Mm. And that's a no-go for me. So just any thoughts on that, or how is your blood pressure now that you kind okay. of Okay, so that's that a really on? good question. Um, I'm extremely sensitive to medication. And so when I went in, the minimum dosage that they usually start you off on Adderall is 10 milligrams. So I knew right away, I was like, I'm not, probably not going to be able to take that because my blood pressure is very sensitive. It was under control. And I, I did try 10 milligrams and my blood pressure went through the roof, right? And then I was like, oh, that's not going to work. But I had asked my doctor, because I know I'm sensitive, to get instead of a 10 milligram to give me two fives. I said, because then I can like build up over a series of weeks. And that's what I did. I took five and then I would, I would monitor my blood pressure. And, and then I had, I, cause I had, um, I was on short acting 
to the first one, right? Um, and then once I was able to take five, like after a couple of weeks, because I doubled up on my blood pressure medication at first. Um, and once I was able to not have that second dose, I was like, okay, now let's go to, you know, 10. And once I was able to do that, then I switched to five extended release. I mean, I really just built up my tolerance, but I know still some people can't do that. And what I have seen help with other people in my life, and I know a lot of people are not a big fan of Joe Rogan, but his um, um, on it, his company on it has a product called Alpha Brain, and it is extremely helpful for some people. Um, also pairing, um, I've heard in the community, pairing lion's mane and chaga, um, the mushrooms, with caffeine is, you know, a good supplement. Personally, caffeine affects me more than Adderall does, and so that's not a good, I mean, when I say that I love coffee, uh, my, my bestie here knows, like, I am a coffee person, so switching to DF was a big change for me, but I had to come completely off of coffee to get the full effects of my medication because I couldn't have the two together. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, another question. Hello, that's a thorough fellow neurodivergent yes. autism spectrum. I've I've heard it all from social media and people mm. saying we're immature. You can grow out of it, behave better. Uh, that doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't. Um, you know, one of the things autistic people like to do is spinning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I clap my hands a lot sometimes. I mean, another thing I've learned over time is to relax. You know, I like I like to have my alone time. I'm an introvert too, so I have stuff on my computer. I there's I like watching cartoons, any cartoon or game shows. <laughs> weird things, but I, I've learned over time ways to manage my autism, and then yeah, autism and the HD are kind of close to each They're other. They're very close, yeah. yes. But, um, like I said, I just ignore the behavior, the people from social media or in person that says bad things about me, because it's, it seems like it's growing, especially under certain people around the world, and it's just... <laughs> it's getting frustrating. You know? Well, there's a lot... Thank you for bringing that up. Um... I think we fall into a lot of a lot of times we fall into the category of other because we are not like you know the other people around us and people sometimes have an aversion to other and so breaking down that wall of um, one with each other and kind of like well we might be other but we are same and being connecting to the other people who are neurodivergent is, has been very helpful for me. But I'm glad you brought up stimming because stimming is also um, really helpful for ADHD people. Like I know, um, so stimming is uh, any repetitive um, activity or motion that relieves stress. And a lot of times for me, it's like with my fingers. Like I will do this or I will tap my hands and that's releasing energy or stress in the environment. Um, I know people who like just like rub their legs or their arms. And um, in, in childhood, a lot of us are told to stop doing that. You know, please stop doing that. You're making other people uncomfortable or so, stop fidgeting. But fidgeting is literally managing your energy supply. And so maybe there's a way, you know, maybe you can't get up in the middle of a meeting and start spinning, right? But maybe you can have a fidget toy or some type of way that you can channel your, your fidgeting. But if you need to spin, by all means, spin. <laughs> Thank you for that. There's... Thank you. Um, you on, one of the, on your opening slide, you had um, auditory processing delay. Um, what, from your experiences or maybe you know input that you've gotten from other people, what are some of the, like the signs that they were showing? They were showing some struggles with, and what were some methods they did to overcome those? So um, I am not diagnosed with audio processing disorder, but I did. But I did go see an audiologist because I do have all the signs of audio processing disorder. And um, I was told that they don't diagnose adults with that. I think that's changed. That was about 10 years ago. Um, but for me, the signs were 
when I would be under stress, people talking to me in my native language, English, sounded like a foreign language. So I would say, what? What? And it's, it would just sound garbled because my brain would not translate the waves that were coming in into correct language. Or um, also, and this, this is across a lot of neuro spiciness, is um, the hyperfocus where you literally can't hear somebody talking to you, right? So you're, you know, you're focused and someone's like, and then they're like, I, why are you ignoring me? I'm like, I didn't even know you were talking. You know, so that, um, and also a lot of, you know, sensory sensitivity crosses a lot of the borders. But I think also, if, like, if you're having trouble processing language, for one, is probably the biggest hallmark. There's a great book called the When the Brain Can't Hear. And this is actually um, what really got me going down the rabbit hole of learning about my own brain, because I had felt like it's almost like an audio dyslexia, right? And um, for, for years, my mom would tell me, you have selective hearing, right? You want to, you hear what you want to hear. And, and I'm like, I, I'm really not, you know? And I was walking through the library and it, it just caught my eye when the brain can't hear. And I just stopped and I went, oh my God, and pulled it out. That is a fantastic resource. And it explains a lot of that. Um, thank you to talking about the voice, the audio processing, because English is my third language, mm. and I literally can shut English and don't hurt anything, and I got a trouble by the head. I, I just figured it out this right now. <laughs> <laughs> Get that book. It's an incredible resource. Yeah. It, it really is. is. And I would, and, and I know I've said this, but if you are neurodivergent in any way, I strongly believe you're probably extremely gifted in some way. And I think that's just the brain's way of balancing. Like you need, you have this extreme giftedness and we had to pull something from somewhere else. And that's just where our deficits are is where we got pulled from. And my question is, how do you keep up with all the ideas came up in your brain, all the ideas that you have when you drive in and you see something, oh, would be cool if I do something or you just, you know, chew in your couch and see like advertise like, oh, that would be nice. How do you keep up with all these ideas pop up in your head every single second? So that's a great question. And I used to think I had to keep up with all of that. But when you're neuro spicy, ideas are like buses. Another one's coming around the block in 15 minutes. And you, I just believe you have to learn to let go. You can't take action on every idea, nor should you. Or you, you know, how would you manage your day? But... It's wonderful to say, oh, man, that's such a great idea, you know, um, and acknowledge that your brain is so gifted that it gives you a constant flow of ideas and that that faucet will never turn off. Can you imagine how many people would love to have one good idea? And we've got great ideas every three seconds, right? We just have to understand and just practice letting go because you can't, you can't do everything. But... If you do have Siri or um, Alexa on your phone or whatever the Android version of that is, I'm, I'm a little ignorant in that area. So, or Google, like, hey, Google, um, you can say, add this to a note. You know, if you really want to track something or you found the answer to something you've been listening for and you know it's going to disappear out of your brain in five minutes. I mean, I really believe in automation. I like that. I strongly, strongly believe in that. Does that help at all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it's just remembering I have a solution for that. Right. right? Yeah. I wanted to say thank you for your talk. It was incredible. I'm like, oh, my gears are turning now. Um, my question, though, is how did you figure out the thing about the eyebrows? Because that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I am just a compulsive knowledge collector. And I'm really interested in everything. And um, I read a lot. And um, I just happened across it. I used to wait tables. And um, which is, I don't know why I would um, choose that as a way to make money. Because that's remembering a lot of stuff in your head all the time. And, uh, but I would get stressed out. And, um, and I read somewhere that when you're stressed, 
raise your eyebrows and it would help you manage your stress. So when I say I would like, if you ever see me doing like this, I would be waiting tables like this. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah. But speaking of waiting tables, when we're talking about audio processing disorder, um, one of the treatments for that is, um, is they have like a recorder and you listen to the recording and you repeat back what you heard, training yourself to remember things. And I, at the time, like I said, I was waiting tables. I was like, oh, so what I do every day. So that's uh, water and you want the burger and fries. So yeah. Kind of funny. Yeah, yeah. Lots of raised eyebrows for me. <laughs> uh, hello. Um, so my question comes from how you were talking about journaling mm -hmm. your food and what you would eat that day. Um, and I, personally, I found a lot of benefit in journaling, but my biggest uh, downfall is there is that uh, I just never remember to do it. Mm. <laughs> so same, like, same. I struggle. So yeah. So what are um, some things you do to try and keep that there for you to do and uh, stuff like that? I guess. Yeah. So I have two a two part answer. If I forget the second part that I'm answering, remind me because you know that happens too. Um, so first of all. Um, part of my bedtime routine is like I try to plan for the next day right do I always remember that no but setting an alarm like you know even for Alexa like please remember you know like if you know you go to bed at 9 30 every night at eight o'clock you know you can set an alarm for Alexa to remind you um and yeah so what was the second part <laughs> Like how do you how do you manage the the journaling? Yeah, I, I think so. I've tried. Oh, here's the other thing I was gonna say. You will find solutions, and then they will stop working for you, and then you have to find another solution, and that is normal. And so you are not a failure if you get a planner and it's been working great for six weeks, and then all of a sudden it stops working for you, and you have to find another solution. That's normal for ADHD. So give yourself grace there and just understand that every solution that you find is a temporary solution that will stop working at some point, right? Um, at one point I was using Obsidian. So at the, at using the take notes and I would have a daily journal and it was like, here's my plan for tomorrow. This is what I'm gonna do. And I would track my things and I would have what's what I'm having for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that worked for about two weeks and then it stopped working. And so right now I'm attempting to do like, you know, taking notes with Siri or Alexa and saying, you know, this is because, well, I need to capture it when I think about it. And so I'm really trying to train myself to let my automations do work for me, my, you know, my smart home and really lean on that. And that's a work in progress. I mean, it's, I wish I had a better answer for you, but it's like whatever works for you and you might have to try four or five of them and then know that you're going to have to do try four or five more again. But I think the benefits of, of planning your food and at least if you know, okay, well, for breakfast, I'm going to have this for lunch. I'm going to go out, you know, so that you know ahead of time, because a lot of us will crash because we get hyper hyper focused and forget how to feed ourselves because now our blood sugar has dropped and we don't, we can't process that information. Yeah. Sorry. I wish I, I wish I could do better for you. So we have time for maybe two more questions. Good morning. Hi. Uh, I just want to say first, I want to say thank you. Um, I've thanked you for other things, but I didn't get a chance to thank you for the fact that you are so open um, as a fellow neurodivergent and someone who teaches this in a course. Um, it is refreshing when people are open because as you know, people are very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So that's my question. How do you navigate when you can tell other people are uncomfortable with the fact that you are so open about where you stand? So that's a complicated issue. Um, I am very blessed that I'm a woman over 40 because when you hit as a woman over 40, you just quit caring what other people think. And that's a gift. If you're not there yet, it gets better, you know? Um, but also 
I realize that other people's discomfort is not my problem. That is their business. And I make a point, if you hear me talk about my neurodivergence and you're like, yeah, you've already told me that. Um, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse with it. What I'm trying to do is make it a part of my practice to be open and explain, you know, like, oh yeah, well, you know, I struggle with this because of this and, you know, or just dropping it into casual conversation. Like somebody would talk about a neurotypical person would talk about any other aspect of their life. This is a huge aspect of my life. And so this is a, just a part of my personal spiritual growth is, and personal growth is to be accepting of who I am. And that's just a part of my healing journey because a lot of us who are neurodivergent have severe trauma from your childhood, um, from just trying to focus at having to live in an environment that your brain doesn't match. So, yeah, but I cannot overemphasize the beauty of being over 40. <laughs> I agree. Not, uh, I wanted to wait until everybody's real questions were over so that I could say one, one thing. And yes, I, I thank you as well. Cause I've, I've struggled with really trying to keep it under wraps, mm. not, not let people pick up on it so well. Um, uh, part of it I've already forgotten, but, uh, <laughs> I, I do think it's really cool that you're, that I'm not the only person that says please and thank you to Alexa. <laughs> well, I tell them, oh, go ahead. The, the other thing, when somebody says, why don't you ever listen? Just look at them and say, that's an odd way to start a conversation. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Uh, talking about saying please and thank you to Alexa. I tell my son, um, because I want him to be in the habit of, of saying please and thank you to everybody. But I tell him, I was like, look, when the robots take over, they're going to know that you are nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, April, where can we find you for the rest of the day for those who still have questions? Um, so I'll be around. Um, and I have, uh, let's see if we can pull up the screen because my screen died. <laughs> let's see if, is it going to work? No, probably I'll not. Oh, oh, but anyway, oh, you, you can, up. Oh. Oh, look, I was too fast. Look how impulsive I am. There we go. Okay. Um, are we going to, can we go? Slide? We'll just scroll hey, there then. Okay. You can follow me on Twitter. I love Twitter. I love TikTok more, but you can follow me on Twitter at the April Weir, I before the E. And um, I'm on there several times a day. Like I'm sure probably some of you are. <laughs> And um, yeah, ask me, ask me anything. So I'm very accessible and very open with all the knowledge I have. So awesome. Big all round right. of applause for April. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Up next.